Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you may be, and welcome to the next session, Resilience is the New Sustainability. Really excited for this session, um, but before we get to that, as always, let me introduce myself for those of you who are just joining us now. My name is Paul Brunogan. I am the Director of Communications and External Affairs at the Pacific Asia Travel Association, and I will be your host for this session. Um, let me just go through a quick couple of technical notes um, regarding this session. Uh, we, it will be a panel discussion, so please do submit any questions for our speakers using the Q&A function. Please don't use, don't use the chat function to submit any questions. Um, use the chat function to engage with the other delegates. Say hello, where you're from, uh, what you think of the, you know, any insights you might have regarding the discussions. However, any questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, sorry, something I should, should just also note that when you're using the chat function, the default actually goes to only panelists. If you want to say hello to all the other attendees, make sure to use the drop down menu to choose attend panelists and attendees. Um, so that is uh, all of my notes for this Zoom. And we've come to our final discussion on resiliency is the new sustainability. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the Special Advisor for Sustainability and Social Responsibility at the Pacific Asia Travel Association. Please welcome Mr. Graham Harper. Graham? Oh, thank you very much. Right. And thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really um, exciting actually to be talking about this because, you know, the travel and tourism industry is one of the most exposed sectors with many destinations situated in hazard prone areas. Um, yet past events have emphasized that the disaster response is rather um, emphasized rather than reducing risks. And yet in our current pandemic, it has really highlighted how exposed this fact and the critical issues that this is raising for businesses and destinations. And especially that they need to be strengthening the current standards and protocols to ensure they can remain competitive post COVID-19. Now, just quickly to provide some context to our discussion, we will be looking at tourism resilience as both a process and an output to withstand adversity and to be able to bounce forward from crisis and disasters. It further implies that there are going to be preventative actions in preparation to a crisis, responses during a crisis, and recovery after a crisis. Now, in an ideal world, um, this resilience is going to be a driver of innovation for destination governance to promote sustainability. So today, our panel discussion is going to be exploring how can we properly balance the protection of people's health and livelihoods to really try to uncover if, in fact, resilience is the new sustainability. Now, with this, I would like to welcome our panelists to please join us and turn on their cameras. First, we have Ms. Ms. Anne uh, Dumaliang, who is the project director of the Masangi Geo Reserve in the Philippines. Next, we have Andreas Hoffman, who is project manager of GIZ, the German government's development agency. We have Trevor Girard, Director of Standards and Accreditation for Hotel Resilient. And Jesse McComb, Tourism Specialist for the International Finance Corporation, IFC. So Anne, Andreas, Trevor, and Jesse, if you would please turn on your cameras and join us for the discussion. Trevor, thank you. you. You've turned on your your camera first and actually we'll be kicking off with you. And Trevor, Hotel Resilient, your organization has been working on risk and disaster resilience for many years. In fact, much of what you do today has grown out of the Sendai framework. Now, 
Just to kick things off, would you mind giving some background on the journey and the drivers of resilience in tourism? Well, yeah, thank you for having me, Graham, and uh, welcome everyone to the session. It's great to kick this off. Um, so yes, my colleagues and I have all been um, coming out of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, uh, where we've been working with the Center for Disaster Management and Risk Reduction Technology. So our background is in disaster modeling, analysis, and uh, management. And for Hotel Resilient, this really started back in 2016. Uh, this was also uh, partnering with, with PATA and GIZ yeah. and yeah. the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, it was the Hotel Resilient Initiative. And uh, the background to this, as um, many of you I'm sure are aware is that tourism is critical, as, as Graham said, it's critical to local national economies and tourism destinations are really more prone to, to hazards uh, than, than other regions, uh, particularly because you know what is often seen as a beautiful location next to the ocean or a mountaintop is also prone to hazards. And on top of this, uh, destinations are more prone to uh, climate related impacts uh, because of their dependency on location and weather conditions. So uh, yes, you could say that our the initiative was a response to the Sendai framework, uh, but it was also uh, the UNDR's um, response to the UNDR's global assessment report, which specifically identified uh, the need for uh, international standards for disaster risk reduction in the tourism industry. Uh, and this essentially became our mandate uh, as part of the initiative to develop these standards. And uh, since then, we've we've continued our work and uh, founded Hotel Resilient to provide even more services uh, to the hotel industry. Okay, so I mean, like the, the, the Sendai framework, UNDRR, I mean, a lot of these are the, the, the big sort of frameworks and things that have been able to help with the tourism resilience. But what, what, what about hotel resilient? You know, could you, you know, give us some indications of the work that you're doing today with that? Yes, uh, so we started off uh, looking at multi-hazard risk uh, and uh, one of those, uh, risks, of course, was pandemic. Uh, and so in our, our background on multi-risk, we, we created these standards for, for um, multi-hazards. Uh, and then, of course, um, COVID happened a, a year ago, oh. or more than a year ago now. And so our focus really, uh, we kept looking at multi-hazards, uh, further developing these standards, but then we, we actually created then a standalone um, uh, program for what we called COVID Ready, where we uh, looked at um, how to, of course, reopen safely uh, during during COVID, uh, and we created a certification system. We started uh, seeing other needs for hotels uh, for training, so we started providing training, uh, e-learning. E we also started working with uh, governments, uh, with ministries of of tourism in uh, Ecuador, in Palestine, and and um, also small medium enterprise uh, tourism associations uh, and we started just just developing different tools uh, to help hotels uh, reopen safely and now we're also going we've we've take, we've created a whole, a whole software around this and now uh, the, uh, we're finalizing uh, adapting this software now to the whole multi-hazard uh, work that we've been doing so we are looking forward to launching that uh, soon so that as hotels come out of uh, COVID uh, and start reopening, they can now look to, uh, the, yes, the, the next uh, potential big events that are uh, multi-hazard, that are not COVID anymore, that are no longer pandemic, that are more location specific. And they will be coming. They will be coming. That's that's for sure. Um, Trevor, thank you. I mean, it, it's fascinating actually to kind of hear how the Hotel Resilient has been able to grow out of sort of those global frameworks, but to actually really focus on, you know, a certain sector of travel and tourism. Um, we'll be coming back to you more um, with some more questions a little bit later. Um, we do have our other panelists with a short amount of time, but thank you for kicking that off. Um, next, I'd, I'd like to move over to Andreas Hoffman from GIZ. Andreas, would you mind turning on your camera? Um, it should be on. You are on. There you go. It's great to see you with your tropical background. 
It's nice to see that Germany has the palm trees and white sand beaches. Underestimated sand and beach destination, Germany. <laughs> Most definitely. Now, Andreas, GIZ has actually been a very significant stakeholder in the journey Trevor just described. You know, he, he, he mentioned GIZ specifically from that Sendai framework. Now, as an international agency working to develop competencies for tourism destinations and organizations globally, can you maybe give some insights as to why the German government views tourism resilience as an important tool for international development? I mean, you and I are working on a project on destination resilience through PATA. And, you know, that's maybe just one example of the many projects that you have been working with. That it is many projects is indeed a recent development. Tourism, normally we were the funny people with the funny t-shirts doing something with traveling. Um, that tourism is an important instrument for sustainable and also resilient development is that really became clear only during this massive crisis, also in the German Ministry for Development Cooperation, uh, which now, um, once tourism stopped functioning, it is always did realize that it did contribute 10% of global GDP, that it did contribute a lot of um, entry level and entry level skills jobs, um, also outside of the capital regions around the globe, and that you can use uh, tourism as an instrument for, let's say, biodiversity protection or cultural heritage protection. Um, this realization now really moved up in the, in the hierarchy in the ministry and um, also our workload um, and opportunities to work on tourism together with PATA, together with other partners like UNESCO or World Tourism Organization, IUCN, WWF, that, that increased uh, a lot. And um, also within GIZ, normally the people working on disaster risk management or risk informed development, um, we never really found a good reason to talk besides socially like me and Marike. Um, but now it really moved together. Like we, we started joint projects where we brought together German tourism industry with the German committee in disaster risk preparedness that never happened before and we are already seeing um, also with Pata conversations we never had. It was always about capacity building has to do with value chains, maybe artisanal production, uh, a little bit of very um, skills-based training for the hospitality sector, but now it's really about changing the way um, managers and staff and tourism thinks about resilience, about risk, about tourism, and it really changed the quality how we consider tourism and development. With this, with this sort of quality of development, you know, and sort of this change in perception, can, can you give any uh, specifics or examples of how you're achieving this? Um, this is actually the most difficult thing to achieve is an attitude change, a way of mm. to change the minds of people, how they think about something. It's easy to transfer knowledge like, um, this is, a, this is this and this many tourists arrive. If I do this and this marketing strategy, I can count that and that more tourists. But how do I change a mindset from thinking short-term from season to season to very long-term and abstract risks and hazards and how to evaluate them? How do I prepare people to think about ambiguity? If I do this, I might have a disadvantage, but I might have an advantage as well. It doesn't need to add up. How do I do these, these book kind of things of volatility, ambiguity, how do I teach complexity? And um, um, I do not have a simple answer to that uh, yet. And I hope in our joint project, we come up with some ways of, of changing a mindset. Because of course you can teach about risks. You can provide the facts and knowledge. And this is where Hotel Resilient provides really important uh, information. But how do you use then this knowledge in having different management decisions, different um, life journey and career decisions that are more resilient, more long lasting, and still um, is, is good business in the sense of um, the three pillars of sustainability. So Whoa. no easy thing yes. to do. 
you're 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 raising you're raising the really tough part here you know to change the mindset to change the attitudes and behaviors um not an easy task um but andreas thank you and we'll come back to you very soon um next we'd like to move over to ann and um and just trying to see ann is your there we go Hello. And thank you. So, and you're now, you know, we, we've heard from Trevor, we've heard from Andreas. You're coming from sort of a different background. It's, um, you know, a, a little bit different perspective. And perhaps you could give our audience, you know, and help them to understand a little bit better about your work. So, could you give a brief introduction about the Masangi Geo Reserve? And really, how has it grown over the past 30 years? Of course. Uh, so Masungi Geo Reserve is basically a conservation project that is centered on a karst landscape located just an hour away uh, from the capital of the Philippines, which is Metro Manila. It started as a sustainable development project actually to restore some 70% of the land um, through a 30% development. So 30% supporting a 70% restoration initiative. And so it was barren. There were so many challenges, but at least after 20 years of conservation, um, it's now a lush forest that's steaming with life. Uh, but unfortunately, the story doesn't stop there because of the creeping urbanization that's been happening. Um, the next step for us was to, you know, our goal really was to encourage more people to love the place, to appreciate the way we grew to appreciate it for two decades. Um, and of course, to be able to finance it more sustainably uh, mm -hmm. for the generations to come so that it can last even past our lifetimes. Uh, so in doing that, we adopted the geopark model, which some of you might have heard of. So it uses a three-pronged approach of conservation education uh, and sustainable development through geotourism, which I believe is somewhat close to the regenerative tourism that we we're talking about. Um, and we took this further in 2017 by um, agreeing uh, and working with the Department of Environment and Natural Resources to restore some 2,000 hectares of land around our project using financing we raised through tourism. So, I mean, and this is, um, you know, really, as you just mentioned, a, a story of regenerative tourism. And it's really growing out of that vision and passion of that dedicated group that, you know, is working on this. Now, here at Pata, we view resilience as a foundation for sustainable tourism development. From, from that perspective, how do you see your work as adding to the resilience of greater manila or you know let's say even the philippines right we are of course uh conserving a very unique limestone karst landscape but what we've realized over time is also how important the work that we do with the metro manila we're found at the fringe of what is locally known as the upper marina watershed uh, so this is basically the water catchment that connects to the Pasig river maritina river and manila bay basically the waterways that passes through the capital itself. And so it affects the lives of the 20 million Filipinos downstream who depend on these forests for clean water, for flood prevention and good soil quality, you know, and all of these mitigation um, measures, these, um, you know, and a lot of risks that um, we want to be able to stop, especially with the rise of um, the climate crisis. So. Uh, just recently, we had this typhoon called Ulysses mm. and um, widespread destruction, uh, lives lost yet again, lots of damage to property and business. And I guess to give that a bit more context, um, a local government unit that we managed to talk to said that they had to spend 3 million pesos, about 60,000 US dollars every day just for the food. Um, that they give to evacuees. So that doesn't even count the cost um, of everything else. So what was then known as a hundred year flood is now happening to the country every 10 years. And we only expect this to get worse in the years to come, unfortunately. So, so. we're happy to be able to contribute to this. Um, 
we managed to plant about 60,000 trees in the last three years. We've created additional measures to conserve um, 2,000 hectares of land. Only in the last year, we are grateful, despite the environment opportunism that's been happening, to have been able to, you know, build 15 kilometers worth of monitoring trails, 12 ranger stations, and basically um, be at the front lines of curbing about seven land grabbing activities. Um, so all of these were able to do because of uh, what tourism has enabled us to do. Um, and even if we haven't had tourism for a while, we're happy to still be here on the ground, um, not laying off anyone at the forefronts of the you know, quest to conserve our forest. I think, I think that you and your team with all of this are definitely fitting into that sort of attitude change and, and, and thought process that Andreas was talking about before. Um, great example of you know, how the dedication and passion can be able to achieve that. And we'll come back soon with a little bit more. But right now we wanna flip over to Jesse um, from IFC. And let me just find Jesse here. Jesse. Hi. And, hi, and you know, okay. You know, we've, we, we've touched on COVID, you know, and, you know, the COVID ready for the hotel sector through hotel resilience and, you know, a few of the others. But, you know, this is a very, very significant event, and maybe we need to address it straight on. Um, it pervades travel and tourism globally. Now, many have argued that despite all of our progress with you know resilience and trying to be prepared and everything else that last year the pandemic painfully showed that we were still far from resilient now in 2020 last year i think it's almost a year ago you were part of a world bank study team on the impacts of the pandemic on destination resilience as an important factor could you tell us about the study and more importantly what it showed for destination resilience in our region? Sure, sure, thank you. Um, so th thanks so much for having us here. And, and I think, um, you know, I think Andreas' comment about changing attitudes and mindsets is, is a great theme almost for this session. Mm. Um, and, and Anne's story really touches everyone's heart, right? I think, I think that brings the warmth and the, the humanness. Um, I'm on the other side of that, that, that education story and touching people's minds. <laughs> I'm very passionate about uh, data and evidence-based decision-making. Um, and that's really where a lot of our research back uh, about a year ago started. So when, when the um, pandemic started, we realized that, you know, given the economic situations of our client countries, we knew that this was going to be um, an enormous uh, impact and enormously shock these the, the economies of, of these developing nations and of destinations across the globe. So in order for us to really think about um, and prioritize our support um, and understand where these impacts might be felt the most, we developed what we've called the Tourism Resilience Index Score. Mm -hmm. And this was actually leveraging data from the World Economics Forum's uh, Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Index. We generally, the industry, we know this well, we use it quite a bit. Um, essentially, the score combined a couple of different factors. So the first was looking at economic dependency on tourism. Um, so that's the contribution of tourism to GDP of the countries, along with the selection of seven of TTCI's pillars. Um, and we chose those pillars specifically as they related to uh, resiliency of destinations. So what are the areas that we consider to have the most impact um, in the recovery process and the ability for a destination to maybe withstand that, those initial shocks of the pandemic. And by running uh, tourism dependency against the TTCI data, we were able to identify countries that basically had a high economic dependency on tourism and a high re resiliency risk, right? So essentially those whose resiliency was most at risk in, the, in this process. What we found were there were essentially 20 or so countries um, that fell into this double risk category, right, where they had higher severe dependency and also sort of higher severe um, resiliency risk. Now, quite interestingly, um, not very many of those countries were actually in Asia, the Asia Pacific region. Um, a lot of them were in Africa. 
Uh, however, and, and maybe I can touch on this a little bit later on, the one, um, one of the challenges of the, this data analysis is that it didn't include many of the small island developing states, um, of which the, the Pacific Asia re region has many. Um, and I, I can talk a, a little bit later about some of the work that we've done to try and um, fill that gap, that knowledge gap. Thanks. Okay, yeah, in, in very, very, very uh, interesting and actually powerful on actually being able to quantify that risk index. Um, now, I mean, that's close to a year ago. And I think since then, you have actually continued this work. Um, can you tell us maybe some of the important factors of destinations to consider moving forward? Sure, so great lead into to an opportunity for me to talk a little bit about small island developing states. Um, so as I, as I noted, this, um, many SIDS are not included in the TTCI. Um, it's really challenging to get data on SIDS, uh, and it, it's, it's particularly in, um, in a way that's accurate and regular. So over, over the course of the past year, you know, as we've seen the impact on SIDS, right, we, we see that these small islands, these small coastal nations in some cases, are being disproportionately impacted by COVID uh, from an economic standpoint. Many of them have done really well from a, a health perspective or being able to stem um, the infections or outbreaks because they've been able to shut down their borders. But the sort of direct opposite of that is, is they are also shut down their tourism industries completely. Yeah. These, these places also have very small domestic tourism markets, so they weren't able to sort of jumpstart things from, from these internal markets. Um, the, the other side of things that we've realized is that we now have the benefit of hindsight. Right? So we're no longer thinking about where impacts will be felt the hardest or where is there the biggest risk. We know, right? We know where, where the biggest impacts were felt over the, over the past um, 12 months. And, and when we look at economic contractions of GDP um, within 2020, and based on that data, we see that SIDS are the, the highest, highest impacted countries. So we kind of took a step back and said, well, Okay, what data do we have? You know, what do we know about these small islands where we can be able to start to dig in a little bit to figure out which ones um, did better, which ones maybe didn't fare as well, and and are there any trends? Are there any interesting data points that that we can draw from this? Um, and one of the things that that we started to investigate is actually the Adventure Travel Development Index, um, which is a great set of data because it covers most destinations, including many, many small islands. Yeah. Um, and while the results of this analysis are still preliminary, um, it showed that there were two themes within the index that had a, a correlation um, to better economic outcomes during the crisis for small islands. So these two themes, this was very interesting when, when I realized this, uh, were basically sustainable development, uh, protected area management, um, including both nature-based and cultural tourism assets, um, as well as strong civil societies mm -hmm. as measured through the humanitarian pillar within the, the Adventure Travel uh, Development Index. So essentially what this said is those SIDS with larger civil societies, with more international NGOs, those with stronger protected area management um, where natural and cultural resources, uh, you know, there were many of them, they were well protected, they were codified. These countries seem to do better, right? So they actually had, um, in most cases, just less decline in terms of, of their economies. Um, you know, and while this is definitely still a correlation, right? There, there's no evidence to prove that this is a causation between these things. I think it's a really interesting point for us to launch a new investigation. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I remember, and I remember the first time we talked about it, I, <laughs> I, I said to you, you had mentioned this and I said, oh, I got goosebumps, you know, because that just really, really hit home. And I think that's a really important thing that we need to continue to consider, especially as we look at what is it that destinations need to be considering as they're developing their resilience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, Jesse, I'm going to, I'm just going to switch over again, and I'm going to go back to Anne, because I think that Anne's example really helps to highlight this and the importance of this kind of uh, protection. But Anne, 
if you were to give advice to a destination that wished to develop a regenerative tourism attraction, what would that be? You know, and how, how would you get local governments and other important stakeholders behind such a development? Well, there's so many things that I wish I could share, uh, but mm. limited to a few minutes, I think I might want to focus on number one, just really keeping conservation as the compass of the destination. This is not um, an extreme green thumbs um, perspective. I did study management and I do see value in understanding that that should be the compass um, for plans for development that needs to be done. So that influences the kinds of land use decisions that we make, the kinds of developments that we make. And actually you'd be quite surprised with what unique executions you'll end up with, um, given the spaces for creativity that could open. If you recognize that as a cornerstone, as a non-negotiable, which it should be, um, given everything that's happening today. Uh, second would be that we spend time really to get to know the area. Uh, the ecosystem, the forms and kinds of life that exist in it, the communities around you. It's interesting how people love talking about sustainability without knowing what they're supposed to sustain um, and without understanding the spaces that they themselves are actually moving in. Um, these, are, uh, these are also components, of course, that are very helpful when you're looking at creating something very unique, um, getting to know your area well enough, investing in the research and the time to get that done will help you come up with so many unique um, selling propositions, so many unique offerings um, that you thought weren't there. Um, yeah. And all of that will ultimately help you create a lasting destination. Yeah, which you know is really what we we, we need to work towards. And I and I do really appreciate that sort of economic perspective. You've brought it in with both of your answers. And you know, with tourism being a for-profit industry, we always need to be keeping that perspective front and center. So thank you. You brought that into both of your answers. Um, Andreas, back to you. And, and switching, switching gears here a little bit because throughout all the discussions, there's actually been kind of an underlying current of adaptive capacity for those in tourism. So uh, basically, quickly, what is that and why is it needed? And how is GIZ developing this for both the private and public stakeholders? Mm -hmm. I think we use resilience, resiliency quite a lot during this discussion without ever really thinking what, what does it really mean? Where does it come mm -hmm. from? What, is, what does resilient cons resiliency consisting of? So. Of course, you can be resilient if you have a mountain of gold, then you're probably quite resilient in, in any crisis and can sit it through. If, if not, then adaptability is your next best um, instrument. Adaptability gets back to what I said initially about these um, attitudes, mindsets, also the way how you think about what information is important to you as a business owner. And, and you said that very correctly, you do need the profits to sustain what you want to sustain, which is biodiversity, nature, um, intact sociocultural communities. Um, it, it doesn't come for free. So we do have to be realistic that we have to have um, revenue models behind it. And adaptability in this context means to, to maybe also think afresh where we can, um, that we maybe leave... Um, past trajectories or past um, roads we traveled and, and maybe think a little bit broader also. It depends a bit if you think in isolation just for our business or if we consider that we're businesses are part of destinations, also of economic clusters, if you like. And you need resiliency and adaptability across these uh, destinations. Like we, we had some interesting examples from our GIZ colleagues in Sri Lanka, which worked with businesses. Um, it can be simple things to get through the crisis, like a hotel with a lot of land and parks um, selling decorative plants, planting them. It worked more or less, they're still getting there, but um, they, they can keep a lot of staff doing the site business and maybe it becomes an interesting new revenue center in future when the hotel is back on running. Or, 
Another hotel lodge kept the kitchen staff to sell uh, condiments, chutneys, and ketchups to to the middle class in, in Colombo. Also, that worked out. So these are things individual businesses can do, but from GIZ or development organizations point of view, we also want to look at adaptability on the destination level. That's what mm. the joint project with PATA is about, about destination yes. resiliency. How can the business is not as an individual business, but as a group of businesses, as um, the entities making up what makes a destination vibrant, how can we help them switch how you call that all the switch over switch gear think think uh, a new and that's where um, Jesse comes in with a lot of data I love data I, I read that in the evening for fun but it's really about um, businesses and areas um, where also the N is working you need to make that work and to make it work you need yeah to need to think it through you need to think anew and once you manage this new skill you probably have improved the adaptability to, to deal with adversity. And if you yeah. put that into practice, not just into thinking and talking, then you hopefully end up with a more resilient business or more resilient destination if it adds from the bottom. And that's, and, that's, and that's what we're working towards together is to actually put it into practice to make sure we're not just talking about it, but we're actually putting it into action. Most definitely. Thank you, Andreas. And Trevor, um, quickly over to you. Our time is running short, but Trevor, um, I, I think you're also doing a lot of work around this idea of adaptive capacity. Um, could you give your perspective on why this is important? And how much success have your clients had with COVID responses due to this? You know, what, what are the capacities contained within this adaptive capacity? Yeah, thank you. And, and I guess I'll just build also on what uh, Andreas said. Uh, yeah, adaptive capacity is so important. Um, for us, we really also look at it from a, you know, systems perspective. So for any uh, disaster response right now, it's uh, with, with the pandemic. This is also a disaster response uh, or an earthquake or a flood. It really involves a lot of actors. Uh, it could be, you know, the hotel management, the owners, the staff, uh, suppliers, uh, service providers, first responders, and uh, all of these together really make up, you know, from the disaster risk reduction literature what's uh, and systems perspective, what they call a complex adaptive system. So everything is constantly uh, changing um, due to the unknowns of the situation, as well as new information is coming uh, p potentially every week, every day. Uh, and um, the system, the the actors in the system, so the the hotel, the the managers, the staff, they need to be able to adapt um, with with each new piece of information, um, and for a, adaptive capacity to to really work, uh, you know, we uh, at least I'll try to just narrow down to to two uh, main um, qualities that mm. that these actors should have and that's uh, structure and flexibility so uh, they need to have you know the structure with, which is where, where we try to help with developing standards so they, they need to um, so for instance a hotel its staff uh, managers need need to know what to do given a, a certain scenario uh, they need to also have the tools in place uh, to carry out those actions uh, they need to have maybe mutual aid agreements in place um, suppliers in place uh, and then they also need to be flexible so they need to have you know backup suppliers in place uh, they need to have backup plans and then as um, you know Jessica's work also comes in so important that they need to constantly monitor and reevaluate their disaster their situation right now with the pandemic weekly updates on what's happening but also with future hazards you know with climate change their uh, risk to hazards are changing and they need to constantly uh, or at least regularly up, update uh, and become more aware of what their disaster risks are uh, and um, you know we've seen this of course with the response with COVID ready that uh, you know those hotels that have really been successful are those the ones that have had good uh, disaster good 
pandemic plans um, implemented, but have also been flexible with being able to change their approaches with, with new being information. Being able to change those different things. And that also goes with what Anne was telling us before about the different typhoons. The once in 100 year typhoons are now coming in once every 10 years. So to being able to being at that flexibility to go with it. Trevor, thank you. Um, one, one last question to Jesse. Jesse, what, what, what are your thoughts on you know, what we've been hearing about from Andreas and Trevor about adaptive capacity, but also with Anne with the regenerative tourism products? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that this pandemic has certainly taught um, everyone and, and every business the need for flexibility um, and mm -hmm. for you know, adaptability uh, to look at what can you know what are your options what can you do um you know when all of a sudden tourism completely goes away and, and i think all of that is really important particularly from the demand side being able to rapidly adapt to changes in demand so this touches um uh, it touches on some of our new research initiatives that we're doing, one of which is the with the World Travel and Tourism Council. It's a poll survey of their members, which um, most of you probably know are, are key leaders in the tourism yeah. and travel industry. Um, and one of the, the most interesting findings from the first pulse, we'll be doing four over the next year, um, was that there was a 27% increase in respondents identifying adventure, nature-based, and ecotourism as being more important when international travel resumes versus before the pandemic. And I think what this really tells us is that uh, when, when travel rebounds in earnest, the industry is already anticipating that tourists will want to move towards this regenerative tourism product experience. Um, and we need to make sure that we're adapting and, and providing these experiences for them. Um, similarly, the other really interesting finding is we, we asked about what policies are important. Um, fiscal policies, uh, non-fiscal policies, and sustainability policies. And on average, sustainability policies were rated higher as a higher level of importance for longer term recovery. And again, one of those results that is just like, wow, this is so cool. You see industry saying this, right? Um, and I think that that's a really key trend um, that, that we're seeing coming, not just from destinations, not just from development experts and sustainability experts, but from the private sector themselves. They see sustainability as those, an important you're, you're part. You're giving me those goosebumps <laughs> again. You're giving your heads every time we, we talk. It's always like that. Thank yeah. you. Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we'll be able to um, send that report around publicly uh, relatively soon uh, so that we can share some of those more in-depth findings with everyone. That would be fantastic. And, you know, we're just touching on so many of these really, really important issues. So many of these actually important trends for the travel and tourism industry going forward. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, Jesse and Andreas and Anne and Trevor, thank you so much. Um, your time, your insights, your expertise is really appreciated. And I'd like to pass it back to Paul. Paul, you're on mute. Ah, rookie mistake. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Graham, and thank you to all our panelists. A very, very engaging discussion. Andres, there, there was a question that's, that came into the Q&A at the end. Feel free to answer back by typing your answer just to get back to that one person. Yes, thank you so much. With that, you guys can all uh, leave. And, um, and, and again, thank you so much for your time and, and insights. Really, th this subject is is something that's very dear to my heart. You know, I was working, I was working with UNDRR and GIZ when we were doing the Hotel Resilient Initiative uh, early. And it was at uh, actually went to the Sendai Conference on Disaster Risk Management. So, you know, it was it's been a long journey, but it's great to that this is really sort of coming, moving full steam ahead, especially with the discussion today and you know with the work that Trevor and and Bijan over at Hotel Resilient is doing. And I know we're working with uh, Andreas and his team over at GIZ in the future as well. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll let you guys all leave and I'm gonna do a quick wrap up so you guys can all take care and say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. All right, so that ends our final session. Once again, thank you to Graham, Andreas, um, and uh, all of our speakers. Um, it's really been a really great discussion. Um, 
And once again, thank you to our platinum sponsors, the Department of Tourism of the Philippines for helping us organize events. Uh, with that, uh, we do have a video that we would like to play from, from our platinum sponsors. So uh, with that, so my colleague, if you can please play the video. I can't wait to travel again. So once again, thank you to the Department of Tourism of the Philippines for uh, helping us organize this event. They've been a great partner throughout the years and it's always a pleasure to be working with them. I also like to thank all of our other partners who've helped us in organizing the events, um, our supporting media partners, our, our platform partner, um, and, and all of our speakers for taking the time and effort for, for joining us over the past two days. And of course, thank you to all our members, our pod, our pod members, pod partners, chapter members, life members, um, for for you know always being uh, continued your continued support. Without your continued support, none of this would be possible. This is the last session. However, we do have closing remarks later this evening at 9 p.m. Uh, Bangkok time. So please do join us as we officially close the Pod Adventure Travel Conference in March. You'll hear from Pod CEO, Dr. Mario Hardy, as well as our incoming CEO, Ms. Liz Ortegera. Um, so please do join us as we close out the, this uh, event. So please do join us at 9 p.m. We have a conference survey, so please, uh, please do uh, fill out the survey, it just takes a few minutes of your time. Your results help us improve our events uh, in the future. So please take a few minutes out of your time to, to fill out the survey. The link is right there. Hopefully my colleague will also put that in the chat. So if just click on that in the chat or you can scan the QR code with your phone and just take, take a few minutes out of your time. Help us help you, um, sort of help us help you serve better for future events. So that is the end of this conference. I just want to make, the, make you aware of couple, some couple things that are coming up at PADA, uh, at PADA Gold Awards. We've actually extended the deadline till June 28th. So if, uh, if you would still like to apply for PADA Gold Awards in, in marketing, sustainability, um, there's different categories from, you know, from for destinations all the way down to journalists, uh, please do submit uh, an application for Pot of Gold Awards, and then we will be announcing the winners live later this year. For more information, you can easily just go to our website, www.pata.org slash Pot of Gold Awards. Later this year, we will have our Pot of Destination Marketing Forum. The dates, uh, we are still looking at the dates, um, uh, but it will be held in Sarawak. Um, so with uh, Sar in conjunction with the Sarak Tourism Board. So please do keep an eye out for that event. Uh, you can just easily uh, find more information about that event on our website. Our website's right there, www.pata.org. If you have any questions about that event, about the Gold Awards, about any of the activities that Pata does or initiatives, feel free to email me at paul at pata.org. I do also remind you that if you missed any of our previous sessions, you can go into the program and watch them on demand. The platform will be available for one month from now. So if you've missed anything, you can go back and watch it in the next month. It will also be on our YouTube page. So you can go and watch it there as well. All of our previous webinars 
all of our sessions from previous events, like our annual summit. They're also on our Potter YouTube ch YouTube channel. Um, just search Potter TV, and you will find all of, all the stuff that we've done previously there. Um, if you watch it, like it, subscribe, share it with your friends and colleagues. And with that, that is the end of the session. Um, but it's not the end of the events. We there, I said we do have. You can still do walk-in meetings for the sellers. Um, you know, make an appointment, chat with them, and maybe schedule an appointment between now and the end of the end of the day. That's why the closing is at 9 p.m. because there's still time to make appointments and meet with the sellers that are exhibiting at the events. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you for joining the session and thank you for being with us for the past two days. Thank you to everyone who joined us physically in Clark, Philippines. And thank you for all of you who've joined us virtually um, over Zoom here. So thank you, take care and stay safe. And I will see you this evening at 9 p.m. for the closing.